Welcome on into the Wolverine.com podcast. Clayton Safey here with Anthony Broom on Thursday, March 21st. We're going to talk quite a bit of Michigan football. Uh, got some updates from Sharon Moore today at his press conference. Also, Michigan basketball's coaching search. We're going to get into all of that. Before we do, make sure to like the video on YouTube, subscribe to our channel, and as always, head to the Wolverine.com. Use the promo code UM1 which gets you two months of premium access for just $1.50 per month for the next two. So get in right now. It's a perfect time to do so. We got spring football. We got a basketball coaching search. So stay up to date with the latest on all of that. Uh, we are also brought to you today by our commemorative issue of the Wolverine magazine celebrating the 2023 national championship. Link to order either the magazine version or the book version is in the description to the YouTube video. It's in the description of the audio podcast, as well as you can find it at the Wolverine on demand.com. But it's over 140 pages looking back at Michigan's 2023 national championship season, 15 and 0, breakdown of every game, features on the key players, storylines throughout the year, all of that. Uh, and it's great keepsake as well. I got a couple stored away. I haven't even torn the plastic off because I'm going to keep them for years to come. So uh, make sure to get your copy today. Uh, let's get into uh, some different topics. We'll start with Michigan football AB. I, I say we just go rapid fire here. I'm sorry I've talked the entire time so far, but Michigan football is different. It's uh, it's spring ball. There's still a head coach wearing a skinny M on the hat. Uh, they're still in, in Glick Fieldhouse. You got a lot of the same players, but there are some new banners up in there. Um, and Sharon Moore is learning. He, he, he called it today about, and we'll get into this, but Greg Scruggs, defensive line coach who was charged with an OWI, uh, has resigned. He blew a .71, which is over double the legal limit. Uh, and I bring that up first to say that Sharon Moore you know, basically stated today that it's, it's life as a head coach. And you know, he learned early on that you're, you know, things come up and you have to adjust and, and make changes. And uh, he's going to have to hire a new defensive line coach as well. But um, so yeah, it's, it's life under Sharon Moore is underway with Michigan a couple practices in. Yeah. And, and I know for all the talk of, uh, well, you know, it's Sharon Moore is the continuity hire and it's going to bring some stability and, you know, just when, and again, this isn't on him at all. Like Greg Scruggs made a very selfish, uh, personal decision that allowed to, you know, that led to him resigning from a job that he was going to make quite a bit of money having, you know, now that these coaching salaries are kind of out there. Would have made six hundred fifty thousand dollars this year. Uh, I think seven hundred twenty-five thousand dollars next year. So it's uh, hugely stupid. Uh, big ramifications for him. Um, it's good to probably part ways there and, and open the search back up. But it just it keeps going back to. You know, I feel like early on in this process, when there was all of that change with guys going to join a Harbaugh and you know trying to hire a staff and the background checks. And I know Sharon had sort of compared it to. You know, being the third and long where you're just trying to you just keep trying to get ahead of the sticks. And, you know, you feel like last week you finally get Tony Alford in there. The staff is set heading into spring football. And then the Scruggs situation happens. And it's just been, um, you know, talk about a baptism by fire in terms of some of the quick things that can change and that can happen. You know, when you're the man in the head chair, uh, he's kind of been going through it. And I think in a lot of ways, them finally getting on the field. Uh, is a good release for him. It's probably the most familiar thing he's done on the job at this point. Um, but yeah, again, uh, now we're right back to, you know, we'll see what a timeline looks like on a replacement. I assume maybe the, you know, they start calling up some of the other candidates they were talking to, uh, but other schools are into spring ball now. So I don't know that everyone's going to be willing to jump ship midway through spring ball or after the start of spring ball, like maybe Tony Alford was. Uh, compensated very well to do so. Maybe we'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, so the search continues now. Just when you thought you were in a third one or so, there was a bit of a false start, and now you're back to third stick or third and six, and gotta uh, you know figure something out here to get yourself finally uh, with the chains moving and you having this operation going down the field. So it's unfortunate. I liked the background that Scruggs brought to the job, but um, clearly, just he has some personal stuff that needs to get sorted out. And, you know, if you're, I think if it's, I, I think it's fair to say if this was a first time offense, maybe, maybe that's something that you can come back from. But given that there is now a bit of a history with, you know, the decisions he's made behind the wheel, 
while intoxicated, uh, it's probably best for both sides that it, that they are parting ways. And now he can focus on getting himself right. And Michigan can get a coach that can be a leader of men and can lead by example and, uh, you know, be someone you can rely a lot, you know, rely on in that coaching staff. You know what could entice somebody to leave in the middle of spring ball is money. Wink Martindale, his salary just came out before we hit record here. He's going to make $2.3 million this year to be Michigan's defensive coordinator, 2.5 in year two and 2.7 in year three. I think, you know, usually anything that happens, we have to get mad at Ward Manuel. Uh, the fan base does. Pretty sure he, he stuck to his word when he said that he was going to increase that assistant coaching salary pool. They all got bumps up in salary. As you said, Scruggs, who has very little experience as an on-field assistant coach, was going to make $650,000 just a couple of years ago. I think Ron Bellamy was at like two hundred fifty dollars or three hundred dollars coming from the high school ranks. This is a big difference. Of course, there's, you know, I don't want to get into anything, but, you know, like times have changed in terms of how much money's worth. Don't want to get into that. But that could help, uh, certainly. And I think these com- becoming public today uh, could help out as well. And something else I noticed, too, in talking to, um, one of our Tennessee reporters at VolQuest about Brian Jean Mary um, coming over is Sharon Moore had the latitude to offer these guys three-year deals, the assistant coaches. And Josh Heupel at Tennessee, who's been a head coach there for a few years, has, has done pretty well. He couldn't do it. He couldn't match. He wasn't allowed to give anything more than two. And you know that was a, a factor in that added level of security. So it, it does help that Sharon Moore is, is being given resources around him to help this staff. But he talked about uh, today as well, kind of his day-to-day is a little less football, a little bit more everything else. Sean McGee, the general manager, is helping in that aspect and the numerous resources that they've they've kind of put around him in terms of support staff as well. But as far as the players, um, you know, he, he said that there's a, a good vibe so far in, in the early going, really since they won the national championship to now. He said satisfied but not satisfied. Um, they, yeah, we want a natty. That's it. That's not it. We want more. He said, that's not a pun by the way. So M O R E not, not two O's there, uh, with his last name, but yeah, I mean, it, it feels like, you know, a couple practices in, we hear from just Sharon Moore is the only guy we've talked to, but you know, it seems like he's pretty pleased with the guys that are stepping up. Donovan Edwards, we've heard now a couple times is more of a leader. Um, uh, the Mason Grahams, the Will Johnson's, they're still somewhat young. I mean, they're still technically in their sophomore year of college, entering their junior year in the fall. But those leaders are starting to come into shape just a little bit here as they start spring ball. Yeah, and for all the the bluster or for how frenetic it was there for a few weeks where you're not sure what the coaching staff would look like and you're not sure you're talking about keeping the roster together, um, you start hearing about guys like Donovan Edwards and, and Mason Graham stepping up as leaders, Will Johnson stepping up as a leader rod moore last week you know in terms of football smarts and iq don martindale uh wink martindale as we all we all refer to him uh, the football world at large um and it talks about him as a guy that reminds him of eric weddle so you know all of a sudden there is so much change but you know you look at in a lot of you know spots on this roster there's a lot of familiarity and there is a lot of carryover especially on the defensive side of the ball so uh, again you know sort of opening up saying that given how crazy the last couple months have been just in terms of the hoopla of, of winning it all. And then the changes to the staff, to the operation, uh, getting this team, which has a chance to again, be a very good to maybe even great football team. We'll see what happens. A lot has to come together, but you know, you like to hear that because it's not, you know, anyone who's said, you know, there's been like this argument that, Oh, well, you know, once you lose, don't, don't get me wrong. Like there's a drop off when you lose a Jim Harbaugh, but, anyone who thought that there's going to be some sort of rich rod level of regression with this team. It's, I just think it's, it's completely outrageous. I mean, you've got two guys on your defensive line that could be first round picks, maybe three or four of them. If, if those defensive ends really pop this year, you've got two really good linebackers. Obviously we, we know all the talent they have in the secondary. And then with Donovan Edwards, um, talking about a guy that, you know, last week, Kirk Campbell said, looks a little more rocked up and looks like, you know, a guy that's take ready to take on that role as being a team leader, as being, you know, that lead back in this system. So they have questions. Don't get me wrong, but um, again, and what are coaches going to say, you know, they're always going to kind of 
to fluff the roster a little bit. Uh, but right now, I mean, it's not like they're starting from ground zero with a lot of maybe getting fami- familiar with assistance on the staff. But, you know, the the defensive terminology, Wink talked last week about a lot of that is going to carry over. The offensive philosophy more or less stays the same with Sharon and Kirk Campbell calling the shots. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's there's a lot more continuity here than I think people are willing to give Michigan credit for, which there might be some merit to that given all that's changed. But you look on paper and there's still a lot to like here. One of the questions that you mentioned is quarterback. And as we kind of expect, uh, suspected and, and alluded to, uh, but hadn't confirmed with somebody actually on the staff is that Jack Tuttle is quote unquote working through something. So as much as things change, they will stay the same. The head coach will refer to injuries or guys not being around or or limited as working through something. So you basically have four contenders currently as they go into spring ball at the quarterback spot, Alex Orgy, Jaden Denegal, Davis Warren, Jaden Davis, and then um, uncle Jack, as Sharon said, the, the rest of the players call him 24 year old Jack Tuttle, who, Again, is limited at this point. No, don't know the extent of his injury. I think to the shoulder, um, but that's going to kind of hamper him a little bit as well. But I, I feel like it, it's nothing totally new. You know, he talked about each quarterback, but still, you know, as he said, in a broader sense, answering a question about the transfer portal in general, you go through spring ball, you see what you have. So I think that's the process that they're kind of going through right now with the quarterbacks and it's still early. They have 13 more opportunities to see these guys, including on Friday after the pro day. Yeah. And I don't expect there to be a whole lot of clarity on this until we get a couple weeks into camp. You know, you're right now, you're just getting your feet wet. You're getting a lot of the installs in. And I think that when you look at, I mean, to a certain extent, if if Jack Tuttle is banged up a little bit, uh, you're not going to get the full sense on what the entirety of the room looks like. But I think when it comes to, how this battle will shake out again. I don't, they're not going to, I'm starting to to pick up the pattern that when you ask about transfer portal, when you ask about position battles, the stock answer is pretty much going to be, yeah, we're always looking at everything and yeah, we like what we have. So to me, I think, you know, like I've said before, when it comes to this quarterback situation, I think over the next few weeks, what'll be worth watching is sort of the feedback, the stuff that's getting reported out of practices um, maybe not even set up in press conferences. Obviously, you know, we'll have stuff inside the fort and, and pass along things that we hear as they become available to us. But, you know, if they're going to really, if there's really an opportunity for someone from the outside to come in here and, and maybe add to that quarterback room and compete for the job, I would think Michigan's going to want that information out there because then you need to start getting ducks in a row with what the collectives can offer, you know, prospective guys that may enter the portal. Again, we always get asked about candidates. It's tough to even speculate on that until you know who's actually in the portal or who might be willing to get into the portal. Um, You know, I would think that whatever the feedback winds up being, if it's not up to their liking, we're going to start hearing about that. And you're going to start seeing maybe moves being made behind the scenes for maybe someone. On the flip side though, it's like, you don't want your current guys to leave so they kind of have to play that delicate balance and maybe some of that has to be behind the scenes but then you know they're going to be kids that come into the office and say hey i heard you guys offered this quarterback or that quarterback it's you know they only have 15 days to enter if you're an undergraduate in the spring it's going to be quite the delicate balance um it it is and it's where i really think them getting off to a fast start and kind of evaluating what this is is important because Let's be honest here. I mean, there this isn't a quarterback battle where, you know, you look around college football and usually it's sometimes it's between two guys. Sometimes it's between three. There are five guys here. So there are four players that are going to be upset or pissed off with where they are at in the pecking order. And, you know, a few of them might be upset that they're third or fourth or even fifth of that pecking order. So I really think there's, there's, there's a chance. Maybe there's some movement regardless. Um, but yeah, it, I don't, I don't envy them. And I mean, it's another, it's another one of those chapters in what college football is now where you're not only trying to keep guys on your own roster happy, but you're, you're trying to re-recruit everyone and you're looking in the portal and seeing how you, how you can get better. I think that's what, why it's so important that they did bring in a GM like Sean McGee, because 
he's the type of guy that's going to head a lot of this sort of behind the scenes work and getting ducks in a row. Sharon Moore, Kirk Campbell, the like, they just need to coach the players up and they can give feedback on maybe things that they might be looking for or a guy that they might like, but you know, their focus is going to be on coaching the team. Whereas administratively you can, you can, you can't just opt out of some of those duties now, but you, you can sort of have a lot more assistance in that regard than maybe you did before. So it'll be interesting to see, no doubt. Let's talk about breakout players. Sharon mentioned four of them today, all on the defensive side, uh, which is like the talent's already on that side of the ball. So it's not, not like it's overkill because the depth isn't where they need it to be probably by the time the season comes around. You maybe would like to hear a little bit more about the offensive guys. He said he wouldn't name offensive linemen because they haven't been in pads yet. So that's kind of out of principle. Um, and, you know, he said that smiling of course and said that you know the offensive linemen get mad at him for that but he doesn't care uh dj waller jr at corner and jair hill at corner as well were two that he mentioned he mentioned dj waller you know length and and uh that they're both phenomenal players uh jair hill is a guy who played in the first few games of the year and then ended up red shirting kind of fell off the map a little bit, maybe something off the field with a few freshman maturity issues, as our Chris Ballas has kind of talked about on here in the past. DJ Waller, though, was a guy who got some snap at, uh, snaps at different points throughout last season, played a decent amount in that Michigan State game. You know, he got burned, I remember, once against Purdue, but also, you know, made a couple plays as well throughout the season in his limited opportunity. So I guess we can start with those two, and then there are two edge rushers, but that's pretty much the competition. I mean, when you look at it, I wrote an article today about it came out this morning about the top position battles. Corners, one of them, and DJ Waller and Jair Hill, two guys entering their second year in the program, are going to be big factors there. You know, obviously, transfer portal is a factor at any position. We could mention that at any point, but from what's on the roster, those two to me are kind of at the top of the pecking order in terms of guys that could play opposite of Will Johnson. Right, and it's a situation, too, where I don't think it would hurt to add another body there if, if there's someone that pops up in the portal. Obviously, last year we saw them add Josh Wallace after spring ball, uh, so there's a lot of room to do that. But, uh, you know, to me, now, don't get me wrong. I mean, what they were saying about Amori and Walker before he transferred in terms of the lateral movement, like all of that stuff, talked about him being an alien or, or whatever it was. You know, you look at DJ Waller's profile, and again, I don't know – exactly what sort of movement numbers he puts up but you look at he weighs in at 63 205 last year probably has a little more weight on him because i'm going off of last year's roster but you know he's got the length uh, i think that you know one of the one of the biggest benefits of playing the quote unquote soft schedule that they did early last year is you know, remember Jesse Minter saying that they wanted to get what was it something like 26 or 28 guys into the game on defense yeah it was right around fairly there. early on so you know, with guys like Waller, with guys like Jair Hill, who we didn't see a ton, uh, it seemed like we saw a little more of Waller later in the year. Uh, but guys like that, like you also, you, there's a little bit of film on them of seeing what they can do against, Kyle, you know, this level of competition. So freshman to sophomore years where a lot of these guys make their biggest leap, I think from a cornerback room perspective, you can, not saying you don't need these guys to hold up their end of the bargain, but you know, when you have a Will Johnson on the other side who you assume can eliminate his side of the field, uh, so to speak, and then you've got the safeties that they have, you know, with the three guys that will be back and Rod Moore, Macari Page, Quinton Johnson, you know, it does, you know, you need to you need to play good football to get out on the field. But, you know, you, you're a lot more comfortable with the idea that, you know, even if there is a bit of a drop off, so to speak, but I don't I don't you know, you're able to sort of scheme around that at the same time. I as good as Josh Wallace was, you know, he was uh, just a well-rounded, really good college cornerback. You know, you look at Jair Hill, he was a four-star guy. You look at some of the physical tools that a guy like DJ Waller has, that competition is going to be a lot of fun to watch. And, and given the way that they like to rotate, I think there's plenty of room for both of those guys to make an impact. I also don't think the, and we'll see, but the receiving cores that are on the schedule are quite as good as maybe an Ohio state or a Washington they had either. So yeah, like you can, you can kind of scheme against that. Like early in the Ohio state game I and mean, Josh Wallace wasn't really anywhere near Marvin Harrison jr. Until 
late in the game, Will Johnson goes out. And there were a couple opportunities like Ohio State did something that I thought was was smart, kind of like a late shift where Marvin Harrison goes from wide on one side of the field all the way to the other. And they did get him on Josh Wallace. But mm. when you do have one lockdown guy, I agree that can, you know, you, you can kind of work with that. Um, make no mistake about it, too. Like Texas is going to throw the kitchen sink at these guys in week two. So there is no seven. Yeah, I guess they have – they got Isaiah Bond. But, you know, even they're replacing a couple guys. I mean, yours sure. is is very good. But I'm just, I'm just saying in terms of having guys ready to play, there's not like that soft cushion into the season like maybe there was last year. So Did it's going to be a – Fresno's going to yeah. throw the ball. Yes, they are. So those first two weeks of the year, I mean, you got to have guys ready to go. So – uh, I think we're going to learn a lot about what how they feel about that room over the next several weeks. I'm not going to lie to you. I know nothing about Arkansas State, but that's a week three problem, and we'll get into that as the <laughs> as the summer uh, moves on. I know USC is going to toss the toss the ball around. So that's what three of your first four games or so teams that are probably going to put a lot of stress on your pass defense um, for sure. In Minnesota, that's where the highest not. paid that's where the highest paid defensive coordinator in college football should help you. You'd think. <laughs> that's a good point um so yeah wink martindale those guys they do have for as much as they're bringing back a couple spots that are still kind of in flux nickel being one of them and i would say depth at edge uh being another and that's where these next two guys that sharon Moore mentioned as breakout players early on or at least guys that are impressing him early on in spring ball tj guy who he's i've been waiting his entire career for this guy to go from a guy to a dude but TJ guy, it seems like he's getting there. And then NL Etta, who's entering his sophomore year. And uh, just a guy who, you know, he was one of their top rated signees last year. And there was so much depth at edge that like, how is Cam Brandt or how are Cam Grant, uh, Brandt and NL Etta going to get on the field? They didn't much. Cam Brandt did a little bit more than NL Etta, but they have some promising talent there. And it sounds like those two guys have stepped up. And to keep this defensive line rotation, whoever the uh, assistant coach the position coach is going to be keep that rotation. I think is really important because that that worked well last year, keeping guys fresh, having different bodies for different situations. For sure, I think that's one of the bigger question marks on this team right now is knowing how Michigan likes to rotate their edge guys. Um, you know, the guys that move. You know, Josiah Stewart, Derek Moore, I think could be one of the better defensive line duos in college football, and maybe they take on a little more of a workload than Michigan pass rushers have of late, but. You know, the guys ahead of him, Braden McGregor, Jalen Harrell, played a ton of snaps. Um, so there are two spots on this depth chart, so to speak, full of guys that are going to play 300 snaps, 350 snaps this year, you know, if they rotate the way that they'd like to. So uh, I know Cameron Brandt was a guy that Chris Jenkins had kind of talked up. I think when we talked to him at the Rose Bowl, uh, a guy that reminded him a lot of himself. TJ Guy, I feel like he's been under the radar for a few years. I wonder if he does legally change his name to TJ dude, if he's able to crack the lineup, but he, uh, it seems like every time he gets out there, like he makes some kind of like, I won't say an outplay, but he's, he's just always around the football. And I think that throwing him into that rotation, I think that that, that will, maybe that's what helps him pop. But every time we've seen him play, I've always, I've always felt like he looks like he belongs. And it's just when you go back and, and we'll look at back at this team from the last three years, for the rest of our lives and, and notice the depth there and be like, Oh my God, like you had good players that were five or six on the depth chart. So yeah, excited to see him get, uh, get a little more time. Uh, no Etta as well. I believe last year he was their highest ranked signee. So there's, there's still talent there. Again, the cupboard is not bare people. It just has a lot of guys that, you know, have played the role that they've played more so behind the scenes than on the field. But, uh, Excited to see them get their opportunity because I like what they have there. You bring up a good, a great point on TJ Guy. He's shown flash flashes of dudeness. Even his freshman year in 2021 at Maryland, he had a sack. He had a sack this past year in garbage time against Michigan State uh, as well. But yeah, you're right. He does he does seem to flash when he's in there. Um, Waller seemed to do that a little bit. And I'll add, I didn't get that opportunity last season, but we'll see what he does. And you're right, Cam Brandt is probably right in that that same mix. I mean, it just could be happenstance that Sharon didn't mention him, but thought it was significant that he mentioned those four. Um, that was pretty much the most significant things from Sharon's press conference. Anything else before we move on to basketball? 
Not a whole lot, really. Um, you know, Sharon is very much from his predecessor school of saying very little while, um, you know, at least, you know, Jim had a nap because Jim was, let's just say what it was like, Jim was kind of weird. You would get some kind of catchphrase or some kind of anecdote where he trails off, but Sharon is, is pretty buttoned up, which I don't have an issue with. Um, but yeah, not a whole lot to glean from today other than what we discussed. No doubt. Uh, let's do a check in on <laughs> Michigan basketball's coaching search. We are nearly a week into it as we sit here on Thursday afternoon. But to me, at least, as we go along here, I think it's pretty clear that a couple things, and we talked uh, some of uh, about this on Monday, high major guys right now are not leaving high majors that they have NIL support at and that are pretty well established to go build somewhere else that may not have as good of NIL support. Like, a, you know, and I think this is a perfect example. Chris Collins at Northwestern. Is Northwestern a better job than Michigan if both were 8-24? and 24? No, but he's got them in the tournament for the first time ever uh, in back-to-back -back years. He has some NIL support there. They were able to hang on to Boo Booey last year uh, despite other teams making a run at them. And guys don't want to build their entire career and then leave for someplace else where there's a risk there uh, given the landscape of college basketball. It's not what it would have been. Five years ago, it's not what it was like when John Beeline left West Virginia for Michigan. But that's that's one thing that I've taken away, and I know we talked about that during Monday's show. But the second thing feels like to me is we're in the phase of dominoes falling. They haven't fallen yet, but they're going to. And everybody's kind of waiting on Louisville and Michigan, and everybody's kind of waiting on Dusty May from Florida Atlantic. They play tomorrow, by the way, Friday at 12.15 Eastern time against Northwestern, uh, but you're looking at him seeming to have the pick between, this is just my opinion, but the pick between the Michigan job and the Louisville job, then there's kind of that tier two behind them with the guys like Darian DeVries from Drake, uh, Nico Medved from Colorado State, and others. And then you look at it as well. West Virginia seems to be waiting on um, – Darian DeVries is their top target, but he's not going to give him an answer until the dominoes fall on Dusty May, which job opens between Michigan and Louisville, if he's the next candidate up for either of those schools. So we're just sitting here waiting right now. It's kind of a waiting game at this point, and I think things will start to move once some of these teams get eliminated from the tournament or they get into the next round and there's a little bit more time. It's going to be interesting uh, for sure. I, I feel like you know, for Dusty May, you have a you have a scenario where, and I think even some people think West Virginia might still kind of be lingering there for him as well. But it does feel like it's between Michigan and Louisville, and for him, the decision comes between, you know, are you going to go to a school that is more or less basketball first? Uh, you know, it's in the state of Kentucky. Obviously, you know, a lot of pride with their rivalry with uh, Kentucky uh, over there in Lexington. So you're really choosing between a school that's basketball first that claims they have the war chest to kind of keep you uh, to give you what you need to attack the portal, attack NIL and those types of things. Or, uh, you know, for as much as been made about maybe some of Michigan's struggles or what, you know, the downsides of bringing Michigan into the fold here is it's still a big 10 job. It's still, again, the TV, I, I think Michigan can probably, I really do think Michigan can probably pay a little bit more than Louisville does given the fact that, uh, you know, you're not, spending a whole lot on the buyout with Jawan Howard. You do have that new TV contract. Uh, and even with, you know, despite what we just talked about with football and all those assistants being as compensated as well as they are still did kind of save a decent amount with not having Jim Harbaugh there, which is obviously they're, they're not better off by that by any means. I'm not saying yeah. that, but um, you know, to me, you know, he's, he's 47 years old. He's got the rising profile and he's got those big 10 ties through Indiana. And it may, it would make a lot of sense, but you're right. Like Michigan's going to have to sell a vision of NIL and how to get all that sorted out. And, and admissions is a huge thing as well. So, um, you know, to me, I, I don't, you know, there is no home run hire here uh, because I don't know that anyone will be satisfied because a lot of the people that are commenting on who they want are people that are, maybe football fans first and, you know, at least maybe casual Michigan basketball fans, but even the diehard fans kind of seem to realize the thing that you said about, you know, no John Calipari is not coming here. 
uh, TJ Oldsberger, Shaka Smart, given those buyouts, are not coming to Michigan because I don't see Michigan being a school that pays eighteen million dollars just to hire someone. Like it's not going to happen. So, you know, I like DeVries a lot. Uh, I put out something on on Wednesday night of maybe my five favorite guys. May was at the top of that list. Darian DeVries was in that mix. I'm a big Pat Kelsey guy uh, for what he's done at Charleston. Uh, Amir Abdur Rahim also in the mix, and then. Yep. I think that Nico Medved, I know his name has come up. I think that would maybe be the highest quote unquote floor hire they could make. I don't know how high the ceiling is. It seems like um, it goes back to something you and I talked about the other day. If you're trying to hire someone who is like beeline esque, you should maybe just hire John Beeline, but that's a totally, maybe a totally separate uh, conversation. But in terms of the names that were out there, yeah, I mean, I don't get too bogged down in it being potentially a mid major guy. Uh, those schools have, Far less resources. Division one basketball has almost 200 more schools than Division one football does. So that candidate pool is a lot wider, and there's you know a lot maybe less things to look at when it comes to hiring a, a good basketball coach against you know hiring a you know a high major football coach. So that's my long winded way of saying that I think that the options we've heard I think are pretty strong, but none of them come without risk and. I don't know if there's any hire that you could make that comes without risk. So um, we'll see what happens. Right. No, it, it's true, especially with the candidate pool. And the interesting thing is, is like everyone seems to have the same candidate pool. It's just like, yeah, we'd love Dusty May if we're West Virginia, you know, and, and maybe he is somehow in the mix there. That would really surprise me if he chose there over a Michigan or Louisville. But it's like everyone kind of has the same list in maybe different orders. A little bit. W would you say, you know, based on kind of uh, you know things that are out there, that it seems like out of the non-Dusty May candidates, maybe Michigan's next choice would be Darian DeVries, and then after that, Abdur Rahim. Not exactly sure on that order, but it feels like those are kind of the next two when it comes to you know what Michigan's looking at. I like Darian DeVries a lot. I think that if it's not Dusty May, I mean, he's he is number two on my list right now, especially if you're going that mid-major route. You know, this is going to be pretty close to a total rebuild, uh, depending on who comes back. That still can. You know, obviously, Terrence Williams has eligibility. Namari Burnett has eligibility. Those Will guys Shatter aren't good has... enough for it to not be a rebuild, even if they come back. Right. But just to have some sort of peace there. You know, we're just because trying to pull out a yeah. starting lineup, yeah. right? Um, yeah. You know, a lot of the question – that the questions that should be levied towards these candidates is who you bring with you. And, you know, Darian DeVries, you know, his son, Tucker DeVries is, is one of the best mid-major guards in the country. You have averaged almost 22 points per game this year. Um, I think he's the two-time conference player of the year or defending two-time conference player of the year. So you would think that he would come as well. You know, DeVries to me, uh, I like that. Yeah, can he get in? Admissions, well, he's a that junior. would be the other thing. He's a junior, yeah. and that's been tough for Michigan to get. Now, could he graduate and then come over? That's or what I'm wondering. Could, could he go to the NBA? Because that's a possibility for him, too. He's an NBA. Sure. He's a legit NBA draft prospect. Yeah, and I think when you look at DeVries as a candidate, too, uh, something I like is that you know he was a longtime assistant under Dana Altman and Greg McDermott at yes. Creighton. Um, you know, he has Drake, Drake of all places, in oh, the NCAA great. tournament for the third time the last four years. And in all six seasons that he's been there, they've won at least 20 games and 24 plus games in five of those six years. So, um, you know, he's a tactician. I think he's a really good game planner. You look at like maybe the Ken Palm profile of his teams. They've had to do it in a variety of different ways. Um, I just like what he brings to the table. And I think that uh, I think he'd be a quality hire. Um, I, I, the one thing I would say is like for any of these guys, just because you haven't heard of someone or you haven't, you're not familiar with what's happened at Drake or at a Charleston or at a South Florida. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't freak out. Like there are a lot of good basketball coaches out there. And when you're coming off a year where you went eight and 24, I don't know that you can be super. I mean, you can be picky. Michigan should shoot for as high as it possibly can, but um, I don't know. I think that DeVries would be a pretty good number two to Dusty May. If it, if it breaks out that way. No doubt. Uh, stay up to date on Michigan basketball's coaching search at the Wolverine.com. Again, we mentioned it earlier, but the promo code UM1 gets you two months of premium access for just $1. This is the perfect time to get in with spring football 
uh, recruiting ramping up again. They got visitors coming on campus over the next few weekends to watch practice uh, and uh, meet with the new staff and everything like that. So perfect time there, as well as the coaching uh, change here with basketball as they look to make a higher like the video. If you're watching on YouTube, subscribe to our channel and we will see everyone next time.